few fighter jets have the legendary status of the Grumman F-14 Tomcat. Fast, sleek, and deadly, the F-14 gained fame among the public when it starred alongside Tom Cruise in the 1986 film Top Gun. In military service, the F-14 saw action all over the world, from dogfights over Libya, to patrols during the Gulf War, to bombing missions in the Balkans, to flights over Vietnam. A pure carrier-borne fighter that was operated by the Navy rather than the Air Force, the F-14 was retired from U.S. service in 2006, being replaced by the newer F-A-18 Super Hornet. However, unlike most American fighter jets from the era, it was not a popular export among the United States Western Allies. In fact, the F-14 was only exported to one other nation. But not only does this country still have F-14s in service, but it's also widely considered to be an enemy of the United States, Iran. This is the story of Iran's F-14 Tomcats. Though we may get a bit bent from time to time, we shall never be beaten. To understand why Iran flies F-14s, we first need to understand the story of the F-14 itself. Development for the F-14 Tomcat began in the 1960s, when the United States had begun the VFX, or Navy Fighter Experimental. The VFX was to be a two-seater, twin-engined, radar-equipped carrier-borne fighter capable of defending carrier groups with both air-to-air -air missiles and an internal gun. The new aircraft was going to replace the Navy's existing fighter, the F-4 Phantom II. This wasn't the first time the Navy had tried to replace the Phantom. In 1961, the Navy and the Air Force had jointly pursued the F-111 Aardvark, with the F-111B being designated as the naval version. Unfortunately for the Navy, the Aardvark had been designed as a bomber, not a fighter, and its lack of maneuverability, weight, and mechanical problems led to the program being cancelled, leaving the Navy with a replacement for the F-4. This time around, the Navy began the VFX program as a sole venture, utilizing Grumman's Model 303, which was granted a contract. Instead of the regular, lengthy prototype and development phase, the 303 was granted the F-14 designation, and development began immediately. The first aircraft, which took flight on December 21, 1970, utilized the lessons learned in combat over the skies of Vietnam. The F-14 featured a crew of two, a pilot and a radio intercept officer as well as the iconic variable sweep wing design, which was able to reduce drag at high speeds while still allowing for stability at slow speeds in both takeoff and landing. Eleven more prototypes were built before the Fleet Replacement Squadron, VF-124, received the first aircraft in late 1972. Regular fighter squadrons began receiving the aircraft in 1973, and in 1974, the F-14 Tomcat entered carrier service. The F-14 was the first of the U.S.'s group of four supersonic jet fighters, which became known as the Teen Series. These four aircraft, the F-14 Tomcat, the F-15 Eagle, the F-16 Fighting Falcon, and the F-18 Hornet, would serve as the backbone for both the Air Forces and the Navy's fighter forces. However, most of the Teen Series jets would see service not just with the U.S., but would also be exported to her allies. The F-15 continues to serve with Japan, Israel, and Saudi Arabia. The F-18 with Australia, Canada, Finland, Kuwait, Malaysia, Spain, and Switzerland, and the F-16 has served with 27 different air forces worldwide. But the F-14 did not see much interest from foreign air forces. This was for a couple of reasons. Firstly, the F-14 was an extremely expensive aircraft to both purchase and fly. The unit cost was almost twice as much as comparable jets, coming in at $38 million or $228 million in today's money. The F-14 was also a gas guzzler, meaning that any country that purchased it would need to be able to financially afford to both purchase and run the aircraft. It seemed as if the US's Western allies would be the only ones able to afford the F-14. However, the Tomcat was developed at the same time as the Panavia Tornado, which many European countries had developed as a joint venture. The French also were developing a homegrown fighter jet, the Mirage 2000. Canada considered the F-14 when replacing its fleet of CF-101 Voodoos. However, it ultimately selected the F-18. It looked like the F-14 would only see service in the US, and Grumman seemed on the verge of financial collapse, putting the whole program in jeopardy. But then, one country placed an order for the F-14. 
Iran. In 1974, Iran was becoming a hotspot for the Cold War. The US had recently become much closer with Iran, which was ruled by a monarchy which was decidedly pro-American. Mr. President, I'm overwhelmed by the warmth of your words and your welcome. Eager to gain influence in the Middle East and to gain a leg up on the Soviet Union, President Richard Nixon visited the country and met with Shah Mohammad Reza Pahlavi, simply known as the Shah. It was during this time that a deal for Iran to purchase 80 F-14s, as well as over 600 AM-54 missiles, was set up. The deal was valued at over $2 billion, a figure which most countries in the region could not afford. But the Shah and his regime were incredibly wealthy, and Iran's accessibility to fuel meant that they would be able to fly the aircraft as well. Deliveries began in 1976, and the Imperial Iranian Air Force became the only operator of the Grumman F-14 Tomcat outside of the United States. It seemed as though this was an important milestone in an important relationship between the United States and Iran. By 1979, 79 of the 80 Tomcats had been delivered, along with 284 of the AIM-54 missiles. The United States has also assisted Iran in training flight and maintenance crews for the F-14, a sophisticated aircraft to both fly and maintain. Then came an unexpected turn that would abruptly end the relationship between the US and Iran and would see the two become enemies for the next 40 years. The Iranian Revolution. Iran in the 1970s was not a country that seemed primed for revolution. In 1953, Iran had experienced an American and British-backed coup d'etat which saw the Prime Minister replaced by the Shah and Iran's democratic electoral system was replaced by a monarchy, one which was allied with the US. The Shah's reign in Iran began with seeing the country rapidly modernize and become increasingly more westernized. Women were given more rights and the country experienced an economic upturn and land reforms. However, not all the changes were for good. The Shah had deposed a democratically elected leader when he came to power, and many Iranians were unhappy with the Shah's growing disregard for the Iranian constitution, specifically the rooting of the constitution in Islam and the guarantee of democratic elections. The Shah began to face opposition from both fundamentalist Shia Muslims such as Rahala Khomeini, remember him because he'll be important later on, and leftist elements in Iran who were unhappy with Iran's close alignment with the United States and growing opposition with the neighboring Soviet Union. The United States, who had been instrumental in putting the Shah in power, were seen as enemies of Iran by those who opposed the Shah, and as Iran became closer with the US, this hatred only grew. Those who opposed the regime were severely persecuted by both the Shah and his secret police, the SAVAK. Many of the Shah's political opponents were tortured and even killed, and those who would later lead the revolution had to flee and oppose the regime from abroad. Despite the domestic unrest, the United States was not expecting a revolution in Iran and were blindsided when revolution occurred in 1979. The Iranian revolution saw the Shah removed from power and Iran became an Islamic Republic led by Rahala Khomeini, the first supreme leader of Iran. The revolution saw a revival of Islam in Iran and most of the westernization introduced by the Shah, including the increased rights for women, were rolled back. Normally, such a revolution in the distant Middle Eastern country would not have mattered to the US, but Iran was not any country. The revolution had been driven by both Islamic and leftist ideology, and Iran, being a neighbor of the Soviet Union, had been a key strategic ally to the US during the Cold War. But Iran and her new government was also in possession of 79 American-built, super-advanced F-14 Tomcats, along with 284 of the state-of-the-art AIM-54 missiles. Such technology in the hands of the new Iranian government, or even worse, in the hands of the Soviet Union, was a terrifying prospect for the US. Immediately, the deliveries of the 80th Tomcat and the rest of the AIM-54s were halted, and thus began the switch from allies to enemies. The Iranian hostage crisis, which spanned from 1979 to 1981, saw the US sever diplomatic relations with Iran. The loss of the United States as an ally was not good for the Iranian F-14 fleet. Not only would they not be able to receive any more aircraft or spare parts for their Tomcats, they also lost a valuable training resource for both flight and maintenance crews. 
In the aftermath of the revolution, thousands of Iranians were arrested for supporting the Shah, many of whom were executed. Many of Iran's F-14 pilots fled the country after the revolution, along with most of the maintenance crews, and some of those who stayed were among those arrested and killed. Many of the F-14s were also not in flight condition, and Iran lacked the spare parts and the expertise needed to repair them. To add to the disarray, the American technicians had also sabotaged 16 of the AIM-54 missiles before fleeing, meaning that the newly renamed Islamic Republic of Iran Air Force's fleet of F-14s and their weapons were in a bad way after the revolution. It would have been a very bad time for, say, oh, I don't know, a neighboring Middle Eastern country with an air force of over a thousand aircraft strong to invade and mark the beginning of a seven-year-long war. And that's exactly when neighboring Iraq with an air force of over a thousand aircraft invaded, marking the beginning of a seven-year-long Iran-Iraq war. As border skirmishes escalated into full-on war, the Iranians scrambled to get their F-14s back in the air. One problem was that the Iranians were unable to repair the American-built radar on the Tomcats, and so most of the Tomcat crews had to be directed by controllers to intercept Iraqi aircraft. As the war began, Iran was able to muster a handful of flyable F-14s to protect the border, armed with the remaining AIM-54 missiles and flown by newly trained flight crews, or crews that had been previously jailed and released due to the need for pilots. The first kill for the Iranian F-14 came in the form of an Mi-25 attack helicopter, which was shot down in September of 1980. The F-14 proved to be an exceptional fighter jet, being able to detect and shoot down aircraft up to 100 miles away and launch airstrikes on ground troops, and was extremely maneuverable in dogfight scenarios. The F-14 was facing off against a wide variety of aircraft, from the obsolete Su-20 to the newer MiG-25s and even the French Mirage F-1. Exact figures from the war are not known, but what is known is that at least two Iranian pilots became flying aces during the war, with one pilot, Jalil Zandi, a former Imperial Iranian Air Force pilot, scoring eight confirmed kills becoming the highest scoring Tomcat pilot ever. As the war progressed, fights between the Iranian F-14s and the Iraqi Air Force became fewer in number, as both countries tried to conserve their aircraft. Iran was also pushing the Tomcat to its limits in the air, and the intense and strenuous flying conditions, along with the lack of able maintenance crews, led to Iran having to scale back the F-14 fleet from the originally intended 60 down to 40 in 1984. By this time, the AIM-54s had to be put out of service after Iran ran out of batteries to power them, and the F-14s were modified to carry as Soviet missiles. Supplemented by Iran's other jets, also American fighters, the F-5 and the F-4, Iran worked to hold off the Iraqis. Although the air battles didn't have a major impact on the war, which ended in a stalemate, it proved that the F-14 was one of the best fighters in the world. Today. 16 years after the United States Navy retired the F-14 in 2006, Iran's Tomcat fleet still flies. They of course have been heavily modified with Iranian-built components to make up for the lack of American spare parts, after most of the American F-14 fleet was shredded to prevent them from being used as spare parts by the Iranians. Iran was also able to build a homegrown Iranian variant of the AIM-54 missile. It's not known exactly how many F-14s still fly in Iran, but it's estimated that somewhere around 40 Tomcats are still in operational service, and Iran is continuing to try to get a few more in the air using Iranian-built parts. The F-14 remains a mainstay in the Iranian Air Force, along with the plane it was designed to replace, the F-4 Phantom. And that's how Iran, an enemy of the United States, flies one of America's greatest fighter jets.